All right, folks, welcome, welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, uh, we're going to start by reviewing some of the stuff that we went over on um, Monday, um, specifically naming ionic compounds. And then we're going to get into uh, the, not quite the opposite of an ionic compound, but um, the other major type of compound that we see uh, in chemistry and in the world, which is covalent compounds. Um, and we'll learn how to how to come up with formulas and names for those, and um, then figure out how to determine their structure, what, what they look like. All right, so we'll start with some quiz questions. Um, let's see, uh, how did they know or figure out the atoms had charges? Um, that actually is, is a pretty good question. One of the reasons that they were able to figure out the atoms had charges, it actually goes back to um, Ben Franklin, more or less, um, or his, his era anyway, of using and figuring out what electricity was. Um, and so Ben Franklin is actually responsible for the fact that the electron has a negative charge and the proton is a positive charge instead of the other way around. Um, because what the experiment was is that he took a piece of glass and he took a piece of silk and he rubbed the silk on the glass to generate static electricity. And what, what happens when you generate static electricity, it's like if you rub a balloon on your head, what happens to your hair? Your hair sticks to the balloon, right? Because you've actually created two different charges. Um, and so Benjamin Franklin noticed that with silk and glass, if you rub silk on glass, that the silk stuck to the glass. Um, and so he just sort of arbitrarily decided, well, I'm going to call the charge on the, I don't remember the exact um, historical way it went, the charge that sticks to the, the glass was positive and the charge that sticks to the silk was negative. Um, so before they even knew what an atom was, before the atomic theory had even really been put forward, um, they had an idea that there were these things that existed that had these charges that stuck to them um, and caused positives to stick to negatives. And then they also, that started um, tying into magnetism in the late 1700s, early 1800s, they figured out that magnetism was related to charges in some way um, because anything with a charge was affected by a magnetic field. Um, and then eventually they then figured out that anything that was moving that had a charge generated an electric field, um, which is the principle of how electromagnets work. If you move electricity through a wire, it generates a magnetic field around that wire. Um, so they were able to see relatively early on compared to a lot of, um, uh, before they used things like, um, knew about anything that had to do with quantum and orbitals, they still knew that there were these charged particles that, and moving them created a magnetic field or was influenced by magnetic fields. Um, here's one, I think I left two links in there on accident. Yeah, that's the link to, uh, to the, all the various types of periodic tables. Um, this other link is actually a link to, um, that talks about how, how um, we we're able to date various um, archeological finds. Uh, and so it's, so physical science is what they're referring to. It's really a combination of nuclear chemistry, geology, um, physics that all allow us to do things like um, figure out exactly how old a particular say, encampment or um, you know, artifact is. Uh, and the most common way, probably the first way that, that this was figured out um, was that that they use radiocarbon dating, which is based around keeping, um, based around the fact that all things that are living on Earth eat plants, um, or they photosynthesize. And things that photosynthesize, they take CO two from the atmosphere and turn it into sugar, which everything else then eats. And that's basically that's the primary carbon source for all living things is either photosynthesis or eating things that photosynthesize. Um, that 
is helpful to us because there's a very small percentage of um, carbon-14 that's naturally present in the upper atmosphere as a result of, of solar radiation. And so everything that's living has roughly the same ratio of carbon-14 because as some of the carbon-14 in your body decays, um, you're eating more food from photosynthesizing plants. And so everything that's alive has roughly the same amount of carbon-14 in it. Um, radiocarbon dating is basically using the fact that things stop eating when they die um, as a way to estimate how much of the carbon-14 has been has reacted, essentially has degraded. Um, so you can look at how much carbon-14 something used to have and compare it to how much carbon-14 it now has as a way to estimate how, how long it's been since that organism stopped eating or since it died, roughly. Um, so this works pretty well but it doesn't it only works to about 50,000 years old after things are about 50,000 years old after they've stopped eating for roughly 50,000 years um then then there's such low levels of carbon 14 left that we can't we can't really accurately date it we can just say it's older than 50,000 years if there's no carbon 14 left in it basically um but there are other ways of doing this one of the ways they do this is is really interesting um is in things like cave paintings, they found ways to date cave paintings that are way older than, than 50,000 years um, by looking at the, the radioactivity of, um, silica, of quartz that has grown on the surface of the paintings. Um, silicon also has naturally occurring radioactive isotopes and you can, we can actually determine when a particular mineral started forming um, by looking at the radioactivity of the silicon atoms that are present at the, in the lowest layer um, that's formed on these cave paintings and things like that. So um, geochemists and, and uh, physical anthropologists are very clever with this. Chemists in general have to be clever designing experiments because we can't see the things we're trying to measure, right? Um, and so this is just another, another um, example of that. And this link has a couple of other ways things are dated in general, um, if it's fossilized, if it's that old, you can date the, you can predict it based on what layer of it's buried in underground. Um, if it's some, if we're talking about something on the scale of um, the formation of the universe, we can date because uh, uranium ores form um, with no lead in them initially, but then over time, once these ores, once these minerals form, the uranium starts being converted to lead. Uranium is so long lived, we can date how old a rock is based if it started as pure uranium and now it's partly uranium, partly lead. We can figure out um, just how old our solar system is by using that method um, because there's still the half life of uranium is about 4 billion years, which is a little bit um, less than the age of our solar system. So, um, if you take Gen Chem, we spend a whole chapter on nuclear reactions and radioactivity, and we get into a lot of the math that allows us to predict these. It turns out the math is not that tricky once you have the derivations. Um, once you know what the formulas are, the math is actually fairly straightforward to predict a lot of these things. Um, last but not least, uh, somebody asked about uh, any internships in South Lake Tahoe that would be good for biology or chemistry students, any science students. Um, not specifically yet. I usually this is about the right time of year where I usually start getting emails from people around town asking if and if I can announce things um, to my students. Um, I have not seen any of those yet this year, um, but there are a couple of good places if you're into environmental science, especially working at STPUD. Um, they're almost always looking for somebody to to do some of the the grunt work in uh, in their chemistry lab and their water quality lab. So you would get to do some of the science stuff, and but and then a big chunk of your your job would be washing dishes, um, which is where I started in labs. So it's not always a bad a bad thing. You, um, the other places, TRPA and other um, environmental agencies, do a lot of water quality testing of lake water. Um, and they're usually looking for interns as well. So I would I would poke around if you're interested in, in doing a science internship. 
Um, they don't typically pay very well, although usually they'll pay at least a little bit, but they don't pay very well um, compared to some of the other jobs around town um, that you could have for the summer, but they are really good experience. And you can see how, if you like being in a lab and that kind of thing. Um, and I will, as, as I start getting those emails, I will continue to announce them to you, um, you folks, so that you can um, decide if there, anything sounds interesting to you. All right, let's practice naming things. So quick reminder, for naming ionic compounds, our approach is generally, you just say the name of each ion. You say the name of the positive charge then uh, ion, and then you say the name of the negative charged ion. So name of the cation, name of the anion. And remember all of these elements that come right that have a negative charge straight off the periodic table to indicate they have a negative charge um, we've used the the suffix "-ide". We change the end of the element name to "-ide", and that's sort of our way of indicating that it has a negative charge. So for this first one, the negative ion would be chloride. Um, and actually, I'm going to switch to doing these on the board while I so I can uh, write in the logic. So if we know that our, our anion is chloride, which is chlorine with a negative one charge, then we just need the name of the positive ion. And we don't change the ending of, the, of metals, of things with a positive charge. Um, we generally just say the name of the element, except if it's a transition metal that can have more than one charge, we need to specify what the charge is. So if the formula, the overall formula is CrCl3, and each chloride has a negative one charge, what's the charge have to be on the chromium? Positive, yep. Yeah. Um, how about a number? We need them to add up to zero, right? So positive three. The chlorine is negative one and there's three of them. So that means that our chromium ion has to be positive. It has to be three because for one chromium cancels out three chlorides. Right, so the name of this ion is just chromium-3. And we generally write it as a Roman numeral. Although if you've forgotten how your Roman numerals go, um, I, you're not going to get marked down significantly if you wrote the number three here. Um, I'm not, frankly, now that I think about it, I'm not sure why we exclusively use Roman numerals for these anyway, since most people don't remember how Roman numerals work anymore anyway. Um, so the name of this overall compound, we just say the name of each ion. We have chloride ions and we have chromium-3 ions. So the name of this compound is just chromium-3 chloride. Sean, is that typical to have the negative charge number at the bottom? And then the top is the positive, how you wrote that. Just so this this is referring to how many chlorides we have. Okay. So if it's to the that's a good point. Let's review that real quick. Because we didn't explicitly say when we were first learning about elements, I'm just gonna use some generic X. Anything that was written up here was our mass number, right? If it was written up into the left of the element. Um, if we're not being specific about a certain isotope, we generally don't write that though. We generally would just leave it blank. If it's written up to the top right, that's our charge. And down here to the bottom right is how many? All right, so to Go back to our other, let me zoom in a little bit more so I can write small enough I can fit things on the board.
So for our compound, our ionic compound, where we got chromium and we have three chlorides, this is saying for every one chromium, it takes three chlorides to balance out the charge, to make the whole thing add up to zero. When we split this up into pieces, we can turn it into writing the charge of each of them. So each chloride is negative one because of where it is on the periodic table. And there are three of them. And the flip side, if we have chromium and it takes one chromium to add up to negative three to make our negative three cancel out, we know it has to be positive and one chromium with a plus three charge would cancel out all three of the negatives here. Right, so that's how we know the charge on the chromium. It's, the, it's whatever charge it needs to be to cancel out the charge on the anion. All right, so I'll go back to screen share and give you guys a chance to practice that, um, naming these. And, get, and I would start for each of them by writing the charge for each of the pieces. So you can make sure you get the charge on your metal correct. Uh, you don't want organic chemistry. That one. I always have way too many windows open. All right, so give these others a try. Start by figuring out the charge on the negative ion, and then figure out the charge on the positive ion and what their names would be. All right, so we'll get started by looking at copper iodide first. Um, so we know that capital I is iodine, and we know that iodine, when it's stable, has a negative one charge. So just like we did with, with the uh, chloride, we know that iodide has to be sorry i'm trying to get 
my stylus working. Um, we know that the iodine has to be a negative one charge. So that tells us if it takes one iodide to balance out the charge on the copper, they must have the same charge, right? same but opposite charge, right? So the copper has to be a plus one. So the name of this compound is just putting the two names of the ions together. So iodide and copper one. Copper one iodide is our name of our compound. All right, so the, the only time we don't specify the number, we don't, the only time we don't put one of those Roman numerals here is if it's always the same charge. If we have a metal ion where we know the charge is always the same, we don't need to specify the number, All right? But pretty much all of our transition metals, everything in the D block that's, uh, and anything that's, Basically, anything that's a metal that's to the right of um, the second column on the periodic table can have more than one possible charge. So if it's a transition metal, with a couple exceptions that I'll remind you guys of in a minute, um, we always want to specify the charge on these. All right. Why um, does why does copper yeah? I have a question. Why does copper have a positive charge? So because we know that we need the entire thing to add up to a charge of zero. So because if copper was the most stable, it would be negative, but we just go off the last element first. Copper, so right? good question. Let me hang on. Let me get the periodic table pulled up and we'll talk about that. So everything to the, the stair step that's on the, that's on the right, I, I always refer to it as a stair step, but I don't always um, fully explain what I mean by that, that thick line on the right-hand side of the periodic table that goes up you know, in that stair-step pattern, everything to the left of that is a metal. And, and the way we define a metal versus a non-metal is that metals become more stable by losing electrons. And non-metals become more stable by gaining electrons. So everything to the right of this line, from boron, everything that I'm shading red here, to become more stable, they're going to gain electrons and therefore have a negative charge. Everything that's left of that line becomes more stable by giving up electrons. So because copper is over here on the left-hand side, it's a metal, and therefore it's going to become more stable with a positive charge. And so I'll leave leaving off hydrogen for now. Everything that I shaded blue is a metal and will have a positive charge. And we can we can also tell that by looking at we're going to get into what we do if we have two non-metals grouped together here in, in just a few minutes. Um, but if it's a non-metal, that becomes more stable by gaining electrons and the overall charge is zero, your, your metal is gonna have to have a positive charge. Does that answer your question, Dana? Yeah. Cool. So SRS, strontium sulfide, or is gonna be a strontium and a sulfide
I'm just catching up with the chat here to make sure I'm getting those. If it's not specified in the right hand corner of the element, we can assume one of it. Yes. So if we don't specify how many of an element we have, you can assume it's one. So for strontium and sulfur, the strontium, it's we don't have a, a subscript for either of them. So we're going to assume that, that we have one of each of these atoms, uh, each of these ions. And strontium. If we go back to our periodic table, strontium is in column two. So two valence electrons, and it's not a transition state metal. It's not over in this block where they can have multiple possible charges. So strontium is always, when it's a charge, it's always going to be plus two. And somehow I just plain out missed there. And then sulfur on the right hand side needs to gain two electrons to become stable. So the sulfur is going to become sulfide. Which means There we go. Um, we're going to have SR2 plus and sulfur to minus. So sulfide is going to be sulfur with a negative two charge. And strontium is going to be positive exactly because it needs to lose electrons to get to only having up to having the same number of electrons as a um, as a noble gas or only having full energy levels by losing those two electrons on strontium and sulfide needs to gain those two electrons. So the name of the compound would just be strontium sulfide. Right, we don't need to specify the number on the strontium because it's in column two. It's in column two, so we know it's always a plus two. There is no question about what the charge could be on it. So MN3, N2, well, going to our periodic table, MN squarely in the middle of our D block, right? Which means it's going to have an unpredictable to you at this point uh, charge. So what we do instead is we don't know what the manganese charge is going to look like. We're just going to look at nitrogen. Nitrogen to become stable has to gain three electrons. If nitrogen gains three electrons, it has the same amount of electrons as neon, and therefore it's stable. So with that in mind, we know that we've got two nitrides, and they're each minus three. So what does the charge have to be on our manganese to counteract that? needs to add up to a total six. of six, and there's three of them. So, three. so yeah, so two nitrides, it gives you a total of negative six. So we need the manganese to add up to positive six, and there's three of them. So if all three manganese have the same charge, they each would need to be plus two. There's three of them, and they're each going to be plus two. 
is it inaccurate to say to state two? Yes, I'll I'll come back to that in a second, Isabella. Um, and actually, let me clear that and write it as a element to be consistent. Each of the manganese ions has to be plus two, and there's three of them. So together, that adds up to plus six. Two nitrogens, each or two nitrides, and each nitride is a negative three, adds up to negative six. Right, so it's, it's generally going to be a matter of just making sure that you um, that our charges cancel out. If we if we got the wrong charge on our manganese, then they sh then the charges won't add up to zero. So if we had written, for instance, if we wrote that manganese was three plus instead of two plus, well. If there's three of them and they're each three plus, that would be a total of plus nine, right? Plus nine from the manganese and minus six from the nitrides is not going to add up to zero, right? So you can always check your work on these by just putting the charges on it back in there and double checking that they're going to add up to zero. If you got the wrong one initially, it should be pretty obvious once you once you put them back in there and check it. We need three manganeses to add up to a total of plus six. So each manganese has to be plus two. So the name for our compound then would just be manganese. Two nitride. That's an N at the beginning there, not an H or a B or some Greek letter or anything. So, and yes, this this basically you can think of this like like an algebra expression. We need the charges to add up to zero. So if we wanted to write it as an algebra expression, we could say 3x plus 2y equals 0. Well, we know what y is because from the periodic table, if y is the charge on our nitrides, then we know y is negative 3. So if you solve this for x, you're going to get plus two. Not a, it's not a bad way to approach it, um, to think of it like like uh, an algebra equation. But a, a lot of people, algebra brings up painful memories or uh, makes you lock up when you have to think about trying to write an algebra expression, and we'll get you past that eventually. But um, the logic behind it is just make the charges add up to zero. Right, based on how many of each atom you have. Um, and to go back to the other question a second ago of strontium, why we didn't put the number for strontium. Strontium is in column, and I missed it again, um, is in column two. In column two, doesn't have a variable charge. Column two will all when it's an ion will always be a plus two. There's no d block, new d orbital getting in the way and making things confusing. So the only time we need to specify the no, let's see if I can get a picker. Um, when we spe we're going to specify the charge, if it's in this region. 
and even then not always because there's a couple of those that are that actually follow really really um predictable rules based on on their electron configuration so for instance aluminum doesn't have a d, d orbital therefore aluminum actually behaves the same way we would normally expect if d if it doesn't have a d orbital making things get complicated we can um we can assume that aluminum when it's charged is always going to be the same charge aluminum is always going to be plus three because it has three valence electrons it could lose right it has no d block to make things complicated it has 3s2 3p1 if we think back to our period our um electron configuration for aluminum it goes neon 3s2 3 P one. So it has three valence electrons it can lose and no d orbital involved. No d orbital, then things behave very predictably the same way as the rest of our, our charges do. It needs to lose three electrons to become more stable. We see the exact same thing with gallium right below it. Gallium has a d orbital, but it's completely filled, which means it doesn't behave in a weird way either. So gallium and aluminum don't have charges that we need to specify. And zinc and cadmium wind up having similar properties. They also are going to always have the same charge. It's not a plus three, though. How many valence electrons does zinc have that it could lose? It has just those, it has the 10 that are in the full d orbital, but th that d orbital is now filled, right? And once it's filled, we're never going to take electrons away from it. So the only two electrons that zinc could lose are those 4s electrons. So whoever said it in the chat, absolutely, it's plus two. Zinc is always a plus two when it's charged it follows the same rules as everything as the rest of our our periodic table when it comes to full orbitals and same for cadmium mercury is a little bit weird when you start getting to the higher energy levels, the all of these orbital energies start getting so close together that very small changes in the energy can make them behave very differently. So despite the fact that mercury has a full d orbital, it actually can have two possible charges. It could be plus one or it can be plus two. You're still not gonna take away electrons from the d orbital for mercury, but it can have more than one possible charge. So it's not in our category of we always have the same charge. The last one that we always know with a charge for is also a bit of an exception. So zinc and cadmium had full d orbitals, and that's what made them so stable, um, is having those d orbitals all the way filled. And same for gallium. Gallium's got a full d orbital. In all three of those cases, once it's a full d orbital, you're never going to break it up because it's so stable as a full orbital. Silver is a, also has a way that it can get a full d orbital if it just sticks its last electron into the d orbital instead of putting it into the 5s. So the electron configuration for silver when it's a metal actually looks kind of weird. It doesn't follow our normal rules. And I'll... I'm not going to test you on the electron configuration for silver um, per se, but it explains these charges and why silver always has the same charge. The electron configuration for silver is krypton, and then it goes 5s1 
4D10. So it actually is a little bit of an irregular in that because we're only one electron away from having a full d orbital, it just steals an electron from that 5s orbital instead. So silver only has one valence electron it can lose, which means it's always going to be the same charge, and that charge is plus one. And I know I went over that kind of quickly, but it's mainly because I don't want you to feel like it's these these um, elements that are in the D block, but have um, charges that are always the same, they still make sense when we think about it in terms of electron configurations. So it's not like I'm telling you, don't worry about why, just memorize that these are the five that always have similar charges, um, because it makes it really hard to remember their charges then too. What I would, and so, Actually, where's the, there we go. So it's these five elements that even though they have, they're in the, to the right of the second column, they're always going to have the same charge, right? So aluminum and gallium are plus three, zinc and cadmium are plus two, silver is plus one. If it's not in these first two columns or in those five that we just talked about, then you have to specify the charge on it, right? But if it's one of those exceptions, one of those five that are in blue or in the first two columns, we don't need to say the charge because it's always the same charge when it's an ion. Normally for this class, I like using the whiteboard way more than using the stylus, but when the periodic table is involved, it's helpful to be able to write directly at the periodic table or point directly to the periodic table. Um, so with that in mind, silver and um, oxygen, go ahead. Oh, sorry. So I was just, it's I'm a little bit stuck or off topic, but not really. So that makes silver a very usable, special metal, right? What would be the significance that, as an example, like silver can be used as some type of conductor? Or Yeah, so silver is a good conductor. Um, so silver is one of what's called the coin metals. Um, the coin metals are actually all grouped together on the periodic table as well, and they're the ones you think of as being like metallic when they're found in nature, especially mm -hmm. copper, copper, silver, gold, and platinum. Mm -hmm. um, when they're found in nature are typically found in their metallic state. Um, and you could include mercury in there too, except it's not considered a coin metal because it's a liquid when you find it in its metallic state. Um, and they, the reason you find them in nature in their metallic state is because they're relatively stable as a metal. They're not very good at giving away their electrons like a lot of these other metals. Um, and part of the reason for that is, is copper, silver, and gold all have that full d orbital at the expense of only having one valence electron. Just like we talked about, gold and copper can have other possible charges based on, on conditions. Um, so they don't fit into the same category exactly, but it's absolutely what makes them so stable and easily found as metals in nature is the fact that they have those full d orbitals. Okay, that's helping me. Thank you. No problem. Um, it also makes them um, not very metallic, actually. Ironically, um, the one, the metals we're most likely to find as metal in nature are not metallic in the material science sense. Things that are metallic uh, are very soft and pliable. They have very high uh, electrical conductivity, um, but they also tend to oxidize really, really easily. So some of the most metallic elements are the ones we would never find in nature as a metal. They're the bottom left category basically because they're so good at giving away their electrons 
Okay, um, that was weirding me out. <laughs> Sorry, that why yeah, they no. were all considered metals when it doesn't seem like a metal in my mind, you know. Okay, yeah, got and, it. and you, we we think of gold as being a soft metal, and it is relative to to say stainless steel or something like that. Um, but it's not compared to co this first column on the periodic table. Lithium, sodium, and potassium are so soft you can cut them with a butter knife. Um, with it's it's they're like the the consistency of not even of uh, butter from the fridge, like butter on the counter level of and consistency. And can also be a gas, right? Or because I've been to like lithium springs where it was only in their ionic form. We don't see them in their metallic form in nature because they're so good at giving away their electrons. Interesting. And so like lithium as a, as a um, medication is as um, commonly used for, to treat uh, psychosis and schizophrenia, but basically it just sort of suppresses a lot of your, your mental functions. Um, and it, they actually used to put it in 7-Up um, the same way that Coca-Cola used to have cocaine in it um, and as a way to, as to pep you up, 7-Up was marketed to mellow you out um, and they put lit had lithium in it and it basically just, you know, was the, um, call this the early 1900s version of a Xanax, just sort of made you not care about much, um, not feel much in the way of emotion. Um, but always as the ion form, as a lithium salt, meaning it as an ionic compound. All right, so let's go back and finish naming our silver and oxygen compound. Oxygen is always going to have the same charge when it's stable, when it's an ion. It's always going to be negative two, right? Because it has it's two spaces away from neon. Silver, we just went over, is one of our exceptions. And it has that full d orbital, but that means it only has one valence electron to give away. So silver is a plus one when it's an ion. So the name of this compound is just saying the name of each ion. So we don't need to specify the charge on silver ion because it's always plus one. And we don't need to specify the charge on oxide because it's always two minus. So the name of our compound is just silver oxide. Which incidentally is when you when you think about silver getting tarnished and getting that that sort of black layer on the top of it, that's actually just silver oxidizing. That's silver oxide that's forming on the surface of of um, silver metal. And when you polish it, you actually use zinc metal as a paste. Um, and the zinc metal oxidizes more easily than the silver does. So it actually Zinc forces the silver atoms to take their ion, their electron back, and turns the silver oxide back into being silver metal. So you're not actually just scrubbing off the, the tarnish; um, you are actually turning, you're replenishing the silver ions by doing that. Um, and it's not so. When in doubt. Um, it's better to be overly specific and redundant than to be ambiguous, right? Um, so, and before we talked about the, what those exceptions were, that's what I would have expected you guys to name it as, would be silver one oxide. Um, and so, I, again, you're not, if you say silver one oxide, somebody um, somebody might think, oh, well, you, you must not know your, your ionic nomenclature very well, or um, you must not have studied chemistry in a while if you say it that way, but nobody's going to write down the wrong formula. And that's what we care most about. So you get a very small deduction, if any deduction, for saying silver one oxide. Um, you'd get a larger deduction if you didn't put a Roman numeral and you needed one. You guys see how that's worse? It's more ambiguous if you need the if you need the Roman numerals and you don't have it, you could get the totally wrong compound. If I say copper oxide, that could be two very different compounds that have very different properties, copper one oxide or copper two oxide. But if you are overly specific, that's, that's better than, than the opposite. All right, so technically, yes, it's wrong to say silver one oxide, um, but it's 
uh, I'm not going to be as harsh with that as if you forget the Roman numerals. So let's look at this last one, Ti and O2. So there's two oxygens and each oxide has to be negative two and one titanium. So our titanium has to be four plus to counteract both of the oxides. So the name of this compound is titanium four oxide. Right, because you can also have, and my my more detailed periodic table actually has all the possible charges for a lot of these compounds um, written on it. Uh, let me find. Where did it go? I just had it. There we go. Um, so the more detailed periodic table that you can actually find on, on our canvas shell, I actually put the common charges that you can have on, on this. It's, it's a little bit too detailed to print out on a letter size piece of paper, unless you have a pretty nice printer. Um, but it has this information on it. And you can see that zinc, silver, aluminum, gallium, Sorry, my my tablet has been uh, acting up lately. Probably it's eight years old at this point. It's probably time to get a new tablet for you, for uh, doing this. Then again, only six more weeks, and we can be back to face to face for the fall, right? Um, and so we can see some of those others that are commonly found in other. And some of them are have a lot of possibilities. Osmium, for instance, has um, five different oxidation states, five different charges that you can find that osmium in. And not, this is not including being neutral as a metal as well. So you can see why we need to specify with a lot of these. Uh, and where is titanium? See, titanium could be plus two, plus three, or plus four. Plus four is the most common, but the other options are, uh, are there as well, which is why we specify. And I'm sure that there was a reason that I was covering that again. I'm sure I was trying to make a point, but it's totally escaped me at this point. Um, so you, I'm not going to take away your periodic table for this class when it comes to naming these. So if you wanted to have the period, the detailed periodic table in front of you while you were taking your test for this class, um, then that that's fine. Um, it's I I just caution you to um, not rely on looking things up too much because the way I I write the test I don't give you enough time to do that. I kind of use time pressure to make sure you're still studying, um, so that it's not it's not a uh, a ridiculous amount of time pressure, um, but it's enough that you can't look up the answer to every question you kind of have to be moving in a pretty good clip. And so if you're stopping to look up everything, um, you're not going to finish. So there's that fine balancing act with, with open book tests, right? Both writing them on my end and taking them on your side. You've still got to do your prep work ahead of time so that you can get through most of the problems pretty quickly. And then the ones that you forget something or the parts that always give you trouble, you stop and look those up when you have time would be the way I would approach it. Um, but yes, you can use the detailed periodic table, you can use your notes, you can use the slides. Um, heck, if you thought you had time, you could even look, um, watch the YouTube videos uh, on, the, on the test for this class. Um, I don't recommend watching the YouTube videos in a time crunch situation, though. All right. 
So let's do these last three. I always found going from the name to the formula to be a little bit easier because if I get, write the name properly, then it reminds you of things like, oh shoot, I really did need to put the, the charge in, in uh, parentheses. Um, so, but the, and the process works the same way. Figure out which ions you have, figure out what their charges are, and figure out how many you need of each of them to cancel out. So instead of using the subscripts to figure out what the charge is, we're using the charge to figure out the subscripts. And so oxide, we know that that's a two minus. Iron three, well, the, we know that the three is telling us the charge. And so if we want to know the formula for this compound, we need to get the right number of each of these ions so that they add up to zero. We need the lowest common multiple of these. So if we had two iron ions and three oxides, exactly. So we put a two there and a three there, they're going to add up to zero, right? So that means our formula has to be Fe2O3. And just one more note about um, the differences in doing this class online versus in person. In person, I would normally make you guys take a quiz um, that was closed book that where I um, tested you just on, can you get from the, from the symbol to the element name, just to make sure that you are sort of fluent with, if I say Fe, you know that that's iron. Um, there's no point really in doing that um, if we're, if this whole class is open book, right? Because you're always gonna have your periodic table in front of you, you should still get comfortable with it um, so that you don't do things. For some reason, this is the one that always shows up is that people think that the symbol for fluorine is Fl. And that's not the case. Fl is fluorobium, which is one of those radioactive synthetic elements. Fluorine is just F. So it, when you, if you mix that up on the test because you're in a hurry and you didn't study them um, before, that is a place where I frequently take off points that I wish I didn't have to. I don't like taking away points that are easy points for you guys when all you had to do is, is that the nomenclature, it's not that hard when we get the hang of it. So let's just make sure you don't do anything silly, like use the wrong symbol for an element. Um, actually, I saw this on the quiz last week too. Um, for the uh, sodium, a lot of people put that the charge for sodium, and I didn't mark you down because I wasn't testing you on the symbol for it, but they said that the symbol for sodium was S. No, that's not right. That's sulfur. Sodium's Na, which, say, which is from the Latin for salt, which is natrium. Um, so just, just be careful with that and get at the very least, I would spend some time, um, studying the irregulars that show up a lot, potassium, sodium, mercury, gold, silver, copper, um, make sure that you don't do anything silly. Um, I say silly, but if you guys got points taken away because you didn't do that, I think you might have harsher words for yourself than just silly. Um, but I won't uh, put words in your mouth for that. Um, all right, let's finish these last ones and we'll take our break and then we'll get into covalent compounds. So nickel two chloride, we know chloride's gotta be a negative one and we know nickel, we're being told that nickel is plus two. So we need two chlorides for every one nickel. So our formula, is NiCl2. And I made a typo on this one because it should not be cadmium 2 telluride. Um, 
Telluride's not just a ski resort. Did it not? Oh, that's why. Is that what it's named after? Is there a lot of that in the area? I don't actually know. Everybody always asks me that, and I always forget to look it up at the end of class. Um, it wouldn't surprise me. There are a lot of cities that are named after naturally occurring minerals that are found there. Soda Springs, for instance. Um, Soda Springs being named for the, the minerals in the in the springs, of course. Um, what am I looking for? Clear. That's what I want. So cadmium telluride. Cadmium is one of our exceptions. It's in the D block, but it's got a full D orbital. So it only has those two valence electrons it can lose. So it's always plus two when it's an ion. And tellurium is right, not right underneath, is a couple of rows below sulfur and oxygen. So tellurium is going to be two minus when it's a negative charge. So the name of the compound or the formula for the compound, we, need, we only need one of each of them, right? To make them cancel out. So it's just C, D, D, E. Last but not least, zinc is also one of those exceptions, right? Zinc is um, in that section where we find all of the irregulars that always have the same charge. So zinc is always a plus two, good. Therefore, going back to the slide here, the oxide, we know the oxide is always negative two. So we need one of each, exactly. All right. So hopefully you're feeling feeling pretty good about ionic compounds by now. Um, we were able to take our time a little bit more today um, since I wasn't trying to finish up things right before the end of class. Um, and the nomenclature, once you get the hang of it, really is pretty straightforward. It's just practicing enough that it's second nature um, and then it's the same thing every time. You say the name of each ion, and that's it. Let me see what the next. Um, so let's go ahead and take our break. There's one slide I need to add in here later. Um, so let's come back in 10 minutes. Let's come back at 2.45. And we will keep going on this.
All right, folks, let's start bringing it back here. So before we can, so ionic compounds make the most sense of any sort of compounds that we can have because ionic compounds, um, everything is be getting more stable by either gaining or losing the electrons that they need to try and make it to having a, a full octet or having um, only full orbitals and energy levels. Um, however, that's not always possible based on the, the makeup of, of our planet. And this is one that I'm not sure how much it would differ depending on the planet. Um, a fair number of our compounds that we have here on Earth are made up of non-metals interacting with other non-metals. So we don't have enough metals that are currently, that are constantly trying to give away electrons. Um, and so if you don't have if you don't have something willing to lose electrons and something else that's willing to take the electrons, um, the other type of compound that we frequently see are called covalent bonds and covalent compounds. <clears throat> um, also called molecular compounds is another way of, of um, describing them. Um, and this, this happens when you have any two non-metals get close enough to share electrons. So the word covalent um, literally comes from the base of in both valences at the same time. Something is covalent, an electron is covalent when it's in the valence of two atoms simultaneously. Um, and I'm always astonished and slightly embarrassed to admit how long it took me to figure out that I'm usually the type of person that likes breaking down new vocab words by their etymology so I can see what, you know, what they mean, where they came from. Uh, it took me a good 10 years of studying chemistry before I ever actually thought about what the word covalent means. Um, but it's, that's literally what it is, is when you get two atoms close enough that electrons can be in both valences, both orbitals simultaneously. Um, and so here's a graph that looks that's showing what the energy looks like. So this is energy on the y-axis. And this is the distance between the two nuclei on the x-axis. And so as you start with two separated atoms, we'll call that zero energy. And as you bring them closer together, you start going downhill in energy. In other words, getting more stable as you get these two atoms close enough that you can wind up with the electron being a, between both atoms simultaneously, right? And so you reach this minimum here at the bottom. The most stable state is when you get to some fixed distance. It's gonna be, it's not actually, it's not that fixed. You get to some distance bet, um, between the two nuclei. That's gonna be different for every pair of, of elements. So this in particular is talking about two hydrogen atoms. The distance between two hydrogen atoms um, is about um, 74 picometers um, or 0 0.074 nanometers. In other words, a really, really small distance. Um, and then when you start getting them too close together, the nuclei winds up pushing each other away because you have positive charges. Um, in the nuclei that wind up pushing each other away. But there's this, there's this happy medium where your nuclei are close enough that they can share electrons, but far enough away that the nuclei are not pushing each other, the positive charges are not pushing each other away completely. And then actually, if we zoomed way in and went, followed this graph way up here, there's a point where it gets so close where you could, you basically force the nuclei to fuse, and that'd be a fusion reaction. Um, and that all of a sudden it would drop way down in terms of energy again. So do they come in and out of the bonds easily? Um, not that easily. It depends on the bond exactly and how big this dip is, how much energy there is in this, in this dip. Um, but it's, it's not easily broken, um, although that does depend on the temperature as well. You can think of it 
um, as as holding holding a golf ball at the bottom of a vase. Um, or actually a bowl, a mixing bowl is a better analogy. If you put a golf ball in the bottom of a mixing bowl, that's sort of like its lowest energy state would be at the bottom of the mixing bowl, right? But if you move it around, if you shake it enough, that golf ball could pop out. That'd be the equivalent of breaking this bond. And shaking it is be the equivalent of increasing the temperature. So they're relatively stable until you get to enough energy that you could break the bond and then it could either form new bonds or it's just gonna have a charge and make an ionic compound. Um, okay. There you go. Um, so the overall, these things tend to be relatively stable. That's not what I wanted, I wanted that. Um, and we can, we can look at their properties as being kind of fundamentally different than ionic compounds. Ionic compounds are stuck together because you have positives next to negatives, but the ions themselves are relatively stable on their own. These atoms are not that stable on their own. So by doing this, this makes, this is what, what we call molecules. Molecules are basically collections of atoms that are able to act as though everything has a full valence, despite not having enough electrons for everything to have a full valence simultaneously. By sharing the electrons, they're allowed, you can count, double count them basically, because they're in two valences at the same time. All right, so. Sorry, my formatting got a little bit funky there. Um, so for instance, if you have two fluorines, each fluorine would like to gain a single electron to become more stable. However, if you put fluorine with another fluorine, neither fluorine is strong enough to pull an electron away from the other. So what you get instead is you wind up with them getting close enough together that you wind up with a pair of electrons that we call a bonding pair, also called a covalent bond. So a covalent bond that we represent with just a single line is actually two electrons for the sake of counting what, as to how, um, whether each element has a full valence or not. Um, and that's, that's the nature of what, what holds together these molecules is the fact that if they got too far apart, you wouldn't have full valences anymore. All right, and so these things stick together pretty well, and um, and we see that a lot with um, non-metals. If you look at pretty much any of any non-metals in their pure state, uh, let's go back to the periodic table here. Um, pretty much any metal in their non in their um, sorry, pretty much any non-metal in their elemental state. So in their pure state, when they're neutral. Um, are going to form some sort of a molecular compound. Um, so fluorine is most stable. If you have pure fluorine, it's going to be present as F2, as a molecule. And actually, um, there are a lot of these nonmetals that do that. Pretty much all of the all of the halogens, which is column 17, Do we have to know the diatomics in this class? So that's what we're, yeah, that's what we're, we're talking about right now. Um, there will be, the diatomics specifically are the ones that are the most common. Um, the ones that are circled here and hydrogen are the non-metals that are um, most, most stable as a pair when they're in their pure molecular form. So column 17, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen are most stable when they're doubled up. So when you have pure nitrogen, you actually have N2. When you have pure oxygen, you actually have O2. When you have pure fluorine, you really have F2, et cetera. 
Um, and same with hydrogen. So anytime somebody says hydrogen gas, it's assumed that they mean H2. Because if you just had pure hydrogen atoms, they would naturally all pair up to make hydrogen gas as H2. Um, the rest of the nonmetals do still make molecular compounds, but they're not easy, they're not simple compounds like just a pair of atoms. Um, carbon, when it's in its pure form, can be either a diamond or it can be coal, graphite, um, both of which are much more complicated structures than just a pair of atoms. Um, so we don't, we typically would just write carbon in a, in a reaction, we would write carbon just as C, even though it's really present as either graphite or, or diamond in this much more complicated structure. Um, and phosphorus and sulfur as well. Um, phosphorus is found in its pure form, has a number of different states, which is why you hear about white phosphorus and red phosphorus and black phosphorus are, all, are just this, are similar to saying diamond versus graphite. They're all pure forms of phosphorus, but under different conditions, they look a little bit different because you can make these molecules be shaped in different ways. And same with sulfur. Um, so the ones that we really care about when it comes to, you know, having fluency and understanding what people mean are the diatomics is what, what they're called. And again, that's hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and the, and the halogens. If I say chlorine, that means Cl2. If I say nitrogen gas, that means N2. All right, and that will matter more when we get into balancing reactions, but it's worth talking about now since we're talking about covalent bonds. All right, so going back to the slides, um, the number of vacancies, so this is a bit of an oversimplification, but it works well enough for this class. The number of vacant spaces in the valence determine the number of bonds that each element will form to become stable. So the halogens in column, column 17, they all only have one vacancy. They only have one empty spot because they each need to gain a single electron to become stable. So the halogens and hydrogen, for that matter, are only going to make one bond, generally. Oxygen and sulfur have two vacancies, and selenium, for that matter. Um, but we see it most commonly with oxygen and sulfur. So they are generally going to make two bonds. Nitrogen and phosphorus, three vacancies. So we're looking for them. They're going to be most stable when they can make three bonds. And you'll notice I'm leaving off the metalloids, the blue ones, um, because although they're technically nonmetals, they behave kind of in between metals and, and nonmetals. And so they don't follow these same rules quite as strictly. So we're going to stick mostly with the general cases for this class. Last but not least, carbon. Typically see carbon being most stable with four bonds. And silicon to some extent, although like I said, sil when you get into the metalloids, their behavior is a little bit erratic. All right, so what that means is that allows us to predict what molecules look like based on how these bonds need to be formed. Um, so this is just a summary um, of the what we were just talking about, fluorine. There's our one bonds, there's our two bonds. You know, those they do the same thing that I did where they leave off the metalloids for the most part because they behave a little bit odd. Um, D orbitals make things get weird, like I've mentioned before. Um, it's going to be a recurring theme. 
All right, so where's my there? So key concepts is memes. Don't need to gain electrons if you share electrons. That's the whole basis of covalent compounds. If you put a bunch of non-metals together, they're going to make a molecule instead of making ions. All right, so here's our last key, key topic for today, um, unless you have lab with me afterwards, in which case we might need to cover um, geometries in a little bit. Um, in order to see what these molecules are actually going to look like and what types of bonds are actually going to be formed, we use a, a tool, I guess would be the best way to, to put it, um, called the Lewis dot structure. And a Lewis dot structure is just a, a good way to represent where the electrons are going to be likely to be found um, in these molecular compounds. All right, so if we have a pure element and, and you see Lewis dot structures for ionic compounds sometimes, but with ions, their Lewis dot structures just tend to be eight electrons around your atom in the middle because they all tend, to, if you have an ion, it's pretty much always gonna have a full valence, right? Um, so I don't really see much use in doing Lewis dot structures for individual elements or for ionic compounds, but where they are really helpful is in covalent compounds, right? And just a reminder that if we draw a bond between two atoms, that is representing two electrons. Once we have all these electrons in full valences, we're pretty much always going to be dealing with pairs of electrons. Um, a single electron by itself is really unstable, generally speaking. And so we tend not to see that in nature. That's actually what a free radical is. Um, if you've heard of free radicals from people talking about nutrition and um, or antioxidants um, being good for you because they neutralize free radicals. Free radical is just a, an unpaired electron, which is really, really unstable. So anything with an unpaired electron is going to go out and find another electron to fill its valence. And that has the effect of um, destabilizing whatever, whatever molecule it grabbed its electron from. And it creates a chain reaction. And if that happens to happen in your DNA, in the nucleus of your cells, it has a tendency to cause cancer. Um, because most mutations in your cells that have any effect at all are going to have the effect of causing some form of cancer. Um, so free radicals are bad for you. All of this to basically say once we get all of these paired up, we're going to be dealing with pretty much always dealing with pairs of electrons. Right, so get used to counting by twos. Um, All right, so here's our process for drawing the Lewis dot structure. There's, it gets a little bit trickier. Here's our, our good general rule is you put whatever atom is going to make the most bonds goes in the middle. Um, and it, it's a little bit more technical than that. It's, it's actually whatever element I guess whatever element is going to make the most bonds in the middle is is a pretty good way of of estimating it. So the one the element or with the most vacancies goes in the middle, and then you put whatever else you have from your molecule. You basically surround it around your central atom. So if we were looking at water. So H2O, oxygen has two vacancies, right? And hydrogen only has one vacancy. Hydrogen only needs to gain a single electron to be stable, but oxygen needs to gain two. So we would put oxygen in the middle, and then we would surround it with the atoms we have left, in this case, two hydrogens. It doesn't really matter where you put them as long as they're around the oxygen. Now, at, this, at the same time, we need to know the total valence electrons we have to work with. 
So you can actually, you could do this before you started step one as well. Um, step three could be step zero if you wanted. It doesn't really matter the order for, for at this point. Um, in this case for water, oxygen has six valence electrons. and six valence electrons, not total electrons. Anything that's in an energy level that's totally filled is not gonna react, so we ignore it. So six electrons from the oxygen, each hydrogen brings one electron. So that gives us a total of eight valence electrons. Right. The reason that this matters is because we need to know what our restrictions are. The whole point of making these covalent bonds was because we didn't have enough electrons for everything to just, for all of our nonmetals, just fill their valences, right? So this basically gives us our what our restrictions are. We need to find a way to arrange the electrons so that we only use a total of eight valence electrons, and yet everything is going to have a full energy level. All right, so once we know our total number of valence electrons, and I'm actually going to rewrite that up above here. So we have enough room to see what's going on. We know that the hydrogens have to be attached to the oxygen or they wouldn't be part of the molecule, right? So we can start by this process by adding a line, adding a bond from the central atom to the atoms around it. So we just used up some of our electrons. So we don't have eight electrons anymore, right? We only have four electrons left. And so the last step of this is a little bit it's not too tricky in this case, but it can be tricky in some molecules. We add electrons to make sure that we fill each atom's valence. So we have four electrons left. How do we put those around this molecule so that everything has a full valence? Do the hydrogens have a full valence yet? Uh, yeah, they totally do. Yeah, they only needed one electron to begin with, right? That first energy level only takes two electrons to fill it up. So we have, and then we have oxygen. The oxygen right now, the way it's drawn, only has four electrons around it. But oxygen to be stable needs eight. So our remaining electron pairs are going to go around the oxygen. Right, and so... I generally, to make sure that the it's really easy to miss little dots on a whiteboard or when I'm doing this on my tablet. So to sh make sure that I'm showing that those that those electrons are there, I frequently draw this little shape um, that's kind of similar to what the, sh the shape of the um, electron cloud would look like. Um, and so those we refer to as lone pairs or non-bonding pairs. So we have bonds or bonding pairs and then we have and lone pairs Go and ahead. that's just the oxygen's bonds unbonded pairs right correct just the hydrogens don't need them and the line indicates the two bonds between that and then those two dots are the oxygen's unbonded pairs just to get a clear sorry yes okay 
Uh, and uh, the language gets a little bit tricky because because different textbooks will will use slightly different language. Um, I'm going to almost always just call them loan pairs or bonds. Um, but you will see non bonded electrons, you will see bonding pairs occasionally. Um, they mean sort of the same same things anything with the word bond in, in it is talking about between two atoms. And so this meets our this is a stable and good Lewis dot structure because it meets our criteria of we use the right number of electrons and everything has a full valence. Those are your two most critical criteria to know if you did this right. And the, the most important is for these criteria is you have to use the right number of valence electrons. We can't create matter out of nothing and we can't um, and we can't get rid of electrons just because we don't know where to put them. Right. So you need to make sure that we have a we used up all of the electrons that we have and no more. And our second criteria there we go. Our second criteria is that everything has a full valence. Right. If you write a good Lewis dot structure, if it's um, actually the definition of a good Lewis dot structure is that it meets these two criteria in this order. There are actually some compounds um, that you can't have every everything doesn't have a full valence because there's just literally not enough electrons around. Um, for instance, BH3 is actually a stable compound called borane, well, relatively stable, um, but it only has a total of six valence electrons. Three from the hydrogens and three from the boron. And so if you only have a total of six valence electrons, you can't fill everything's energy levels or everything's um, valence, right? Because you need a total of eight electrons to fill boron's um, energy level. So in this case, our best case scenario for a Lewis dot structure in this case is we can fill criteria one and make sure we only use valence elect uh, six valence electrons, and then we're, we can't really um, fulfill criteria two. We can't literally don't have the option to write a Lewis dot structure that fills the valence of boron in this case. So our Lewis dot structure in this case would just look like this. All right, so as you can imagine, borane's not that stable because we still have an incomplete orbital. Um, so it'll react with other things relatively quickly, but it's stable enough that we need to be able to draw a Lewis dot structure for it. All right, so this is just showing the the process, not in my chicken scratch. Um, the last, not the last, the last one for now, the last um, new wrinkle with these is that if we don't have enough electrons to fill everything's valences, sometime, sometimes we can form double or triple bonds. So for instance, if we look at CO2, if we count up all the electrons, valence electrons, we have four valence electrons from the carbon and we have two oxygens, each of which brings six valence electrons. That gives us a total of um, four plus 12, right, 16?
So if we go through our process of um, drawing Lewis dot structure, which again, we start with put your atom with the most vacancies in the middle, put the other atoms on either side of it, and then start distributing electrons. We know there has to be at least one bond in between from the car from carbon to each oxygen. So we just used a total of, we just used four electrons, right? So now we only have 12 electrons left. How many electrons does each oxygen need still? And Six. we need to get to a total of eight. So how many more does each oxygen need? So doesn't each oxygen need six more each? Each oxygen needs six more, exactly. So if each oxygen gets six more, that's all of our electrons, right? We only have 12 electrons left. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And we're out of electrons. So in the number one rule is you have to use the number of electrons you have. We can't just add two more pairs of electrons to carbon because it would make our life easier. We can only add the electrons we have. So the way we can satisfy everything's valence without adding in extra electrons is if we made the oxygen share more. Eat the carbon still needs another two pairs of electrons. So what if we made each oxygen share two pairs of electrons? Now each, we still have a total of 12 electrons, or sorry, 16 electrons. Each oxygen still has eight electrons around it, and the carbon has eight electrons around it, two, four, six, eight. Four bonds is eight electrons, right? So this wasn't possible with boring because hydrogen can never make double bonds because it only has one pair of electrons to give up. But generally our approach, if we have something where we don't have enough electrons to just straight up fill everything's valence, is we're gonna make one, um, one or more atoms share more than they normally would. All right, and we see that for this, um, when we actually look at CO2 structure, it does actually wind up forming into a shape that looks about like this where you get carbon in the middle, oxygen on either end. All right, so there's practice drawing Lewis dot structures here that we will take up on Monday. Um, and if you had lab on Monday, then we talked about Vesper and molecular geometries already. And this Lewis dot structure lecture should now make, make that make even more sense. Um, if you have lab today and you haven't watched the video from Monday's lab, um, come to lab and I will go over how the, how the Lewis dot structure tells us the overall shape of a molecule um, by following these same rules. And it, it'll be, a, it shouldn't take too long um, to go through that and uh, I'll get you started on the lab um, or you can watch the video and just uh, stop in at lab if you have any questions. All right, any, anything before we end for the day? Any questions? Um, I had one for you, Sean. Yeah. Um, so I was looking at the homework and there's a lot of like chlorite and nitrite. Are we supposed to use the polyatomic ions, the big six? That's good. So we have one minute left here. So let's, uh, 
I will point get you to one more important slide on here that I was not going to cover today, but I forgot that that was on the homework. Um, occasionally, you wind up with a covalent compound that actually has a charge. Um, and so this is in the in the slides. Um, this is a, a list of molecules that are called polyatomic ions. Poly meaning more than one, atomic meaning atoms. So more than one atoms, but when you put them together, you get a charge on what's what's there. Um, and so these we can treat just like any other ions when it comes to ionic compounds. Um, so and we'll we'll talk about. I don't like to just give you the well. You're just going to have to memorize this um, explanation. But a lot of these names. Um, you will wind up having to memorize at one point or another. We'll talk about drawing Lewis dot structures for some of these as well. Um, for now, just know that these are other names. Anything that doesn't end in IDE, if you have something that ends in IDE, that's probably a negative ion from the periodic table, right? So chloride, um, sulfide, oxide. If it ends in anything except for IDE, it's probably a polyatomic ion and it's on this list somewhere. So if I said sodium nitrate, the way to draw the formula for that would be to say, okay, well, so I know sodium is going to be Na plus. And then you come in here and you find nitrate. And you see nitrate is NO3 with a negative charge. So this is still follows our rules for, for ionic names. You just say the name of each ion. We're just adding a bunch of new ions on there um, that aren't just simple um, straight off the periodic table ions. So the formula for sodium nitrate then would just be NaNO3. One sodium for every one nitrate. Um, because they potentially. If sodium had potentially a plus two charge, would it be Na parentheses NO3 two? Is that how we? So let's do it? calcium then instead of sodium because calcium does have a plus two charge. We want it calcium nitrate. Calcium's got a two plus, and nitrate still is NO3 with a negative one. So you need two nitrates for every one calcium, following our same logic we did at the beginning of class. So our formula then is CA, then you use parentheses, NO3, 2. So it's still just nitrate. We just need two of them to do this. And so it looks more intimidating than, than the other ionic compounds we were looking at, but they behave according to the same rules. This just gives us a bigger vocabulary um, because these are these are ions that really exist in nature. and um, sometimes form, um, sometimes form ionic compounds, right? So on the homework, when you get to anything that's not IDE, anytime you see something with it's not IDE, or if you're starting from the formula and you want the name, you go the other way. So if I if I asked you what the name was of say Na3PO4. Like, well, it's you just have to recognize that this PO4 is a polyatomic ion and it's going to be on our list somewhere. There it is. Phosphate has a negative three charge. That's supposed to be a three on that sodium. So the name of this compound would just be sodium phosphate. Right? Same rules, just more vocabulary now. And just like always, I've managed to go almost exactly five minutes over. Um, and we will practice with these next week when we do review. Um, so work on the homework with them. Do the best you can. And we'll go over it. Any questions you have. And then um, if you have lec uh, lab with me today and want to talk and uh, would rather be there in Zoom instead of watching the YouTube video, um, come to lab and say 10 minutes 
Mathematics at uh, 335, and we'll talk about um, uh, molecular geometries in this week's lab assignment. All right. All right. Good job. I'll see everybody either in a few minutes or next week.